The name of this lecture is Cartesian Metaphysics. It's the first of two lectures on Descartes. Uh, the second one focuses on Descartes and uh, Noam Chomsky and Neo-Cartesian linguistics and their relation to the animal. Uh, this particular lecture, the first one of the two, is uh, intended to help build a foundation uh, in understanding Cartesian metaphysics, particularly for those coming to Descartes for the first time. And so, um, as we're going to see, the, uh, the, the, the later material that we're studying as a part of the series that I'm uh, putting up here on the web is um, related to deconstruction, the writings of Heidegger and Derrida. And uh, as anybody who's read any of these texts can tell you, uh, you really need to have a pretty good preparation in Descartes to understand the writings of either Heidegger or Derrida. Uh, part of the reason for this is because um, Heidegger is uh, assuming uh, or, or is criticizing Descartes' posture of certainty, and uh, this is something that Derrida will uh, will also affirm in his uh, critique of. Uh, Descartes, this notion of the certainty of the perceiving subject and that that, that that begins with making a kind of a knowledge claim that is unproblematically, at least in the eyes of the person who makes the claim, metaphysical, uh, and uh, often you know one that is oblivious to its own a claim that's oblivious to its own metaphysical foundations, and so we're going to carefully walk through some of these. Uh, some of these ideas in Descartes, and I hope that this lecture will be helpful to you uh, as, as you read not only Descartes, but uh, other readings that are related. Okay, so um, here you can see uh, a picture of Mr. Descartes. Uh, he lived from 1596 to 1650. This, we're going to be focusing mostly on discourse on method, which is probably the most important text, although first meditations is also uh, very important as well, um, but uh, or meditation on first philosophy. But th this is a this is a really important text, and um, you know it's worth pausing over and carefully uh, studying. Uh, one of the things that's characteristic of Descartes' writing is that he did not like to think of himself as a, a writer. He disdained writing, in effect, much like Plato. Both he and Plato have an ambivalent relationship to writing. Um, and yet, uh, it's, it's interesting to note that, that the Descartes' discourse is uh, written with a kind of a poetic density that you can certainly uh, appreciate because there's, there's no extra verbiage. There's no unnecessary language. Every single word is carefully well chosen. And so you can study it. Uh, very carefully and dismantle it very carefully like you might if you were uh, analyzing a poem, for instance, which also, uh, you know, poetic discourse is characterized also by its uh, density, saying as much as possible with as few words as possible. And this is true of Descartes. And to his credit, he is also, uh, you know, uh, easy to read at the same time. And so, um, I'm, uh, as I've said uh, previously, I'm not a big uh, fan of Descartes, but um, I do uh, 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 honor his uh, uh, skill as, as a writer. He certainly was was very um, uh, thoughtful in his uh, approach. Okay, all right. So um, uh, let's let's uh, review here. I have a few uh, basic uh, ideas here that I'm putting up. Just just to kind of terminology that you need to be familiar with. These are all terms that you should uh, know if you're doing work in critical theory uh, you should understand uh, or, or even in philosophy you should understand differences between Cartesian rationalism and British empiricism and we'll review that in uh, this lecture uh, and, and lectures to come we won't talk that much about British empiricism but we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to it uh, in, in a future lecture. Uh, the differences between the deductive method, which is the Cartesian approach, and the inductive method, which is characteristic of empiricism. The cogito ergo sum, or the cogito, these are terms that you often run across in the work of, uh, of contemporary critical theorists and who 
who simply assume that you know what these terms are that come from Descartes. And indeed, you should know what they are. Now, uh, the cogito ergo sum is that famous uh, you know, phrase, I think, therefore I am. And um, the cogito is the thinking is it's linked to this idea of the, the thinking. You can see the term underneath there. The res uh, cogitans is the thinking thing. And this is what we're going to see that uh, Descartes will finally, uh, you know, well, this, this will become his definition of what he is or what man is, is a, is a thing that that thinks. All right. So you'll often see this term as well, just dropped in uh, into, like, let's say, the texts of Derrida, Heidegger, Foucault and many other critical theorists who will just assume that, you know, these things. And indeed, you should know these things. Um, differences between the adventitious idea and the innate idea or the path dependent idea and the idea that is on the human interior that is thought to be a transcendental and the thinking of Descartes as well as as we've seen in uh, Plato and Plato's Timaeus. And so uh, these are terms that we'll all review and these are terms that, that you should retain from this study. Okay. To put this, however, in historical context, we need to kind of review a little bit because we started with, I mean, I, we, in, in the previous lectures prior to this one, we spent some time talking about Plato. We went into pretty uh, good detail discussing the Timaeus and also discussing Phaedrus. And then we just sort of skipped over a lot of, lot of centuries. And we also skipped over Aristotle, which uh, for, for Heidegger would be, outrageous. You know, Heidegger is going to say, well, if you want to do philosophy or read philosophy, you should spend about at least a decade reading uh, Aristotle. Well, we don't have a decade uh, to, to read uh, Aristotle, but I think that that uh, observation by Heidegger should uh, clarify how important it is to read and understand and know Aristotle. Um, and uh, I can't, uh, you know, time being what we're being as pressed as we are to cover the material that we're going to be covering. I can only discuss Aristotle in passing, uh, especially insofar as he helps us to understand the theorists, philosophers, thinkers that we are studying. So we will uh, talk a little bit about Aristotle and review his concepts, but um, unfortunately not as much as I, I would wish. Um, but uh, let's let's again placing this in a historical framework. So when we read the text of Plato, if you look at the uh, image of Augustine of Hippo and the dates there of his life, 354 to 430 Common Era, uh, this is uh, you know he stands at a distance of about eight or nine hundred years from Plato and Socrates, and he's the most uh, arguably, I, th I think, in my view, he is the most important Neo-Platonist thinker. Um, uh, of, of the era, of the common era, uh, there's other th uh, thinkers like um, Plotinus, for instance, who are important. But Augustine, when one, when one uh, considers the impact that Augustine had on uh, Western European civilization, it's really difficult to um, overemphasize his importance. Um, and and what he's notable for is as we're going to see, you know, sort of as we'll talk more when we get into our reading of Heidegger's introduction to metaphysics, um, uh, after the Christianization of uh, Platonic uh, Greek, you know, Hellenic thinking um, that occurs, say, in the uh, Gospel of John and in the epistles of, of Paul, Augustine is going to develop a, a, a pretty comprehensive uh, synthesis of uh, Platonic idealism and Christian theology. And so this way of thinking, uh, th this, this theological orientation to Christianity is going to prevail in, in Europe for a very long time. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in, in doing further reading of Augustine, again, I recommend On Christian Doctrine. It's an, es it's an essential text for students of, of critical theory, hermeneutics, who are interested in questions of interpretation, given its lasting uh, significance. Uh, also, of course, his Confessions, another really interesting book, and his uh, City of God, which is kind of his um, uh, rejoinder or, or, or response to Plato's uh, Republic. Um, but if we look over here to the right, you can see Thomas Aquinas. And if you look at the dates of his life, he's, he's about at the same distance from Augustine, that, is, that Augustine is from Plato, and uh, with Aquinas, the, both of them are canonized saints in the Catholic Church, 
But with Aquinas comes a transformation in Christian theology in the West. And this is uh, what, in effect, Descartes is responding to in his uh, discourse on method, because Descartes was, was trained in the uh, Thomas tradition of the scholastics. So we find him in discourse on method, uh, you know, criticizing the scholastics. So we need to stop and pause for a minute uh, to, to reflect upon what, what it is that he is uh, rejecting. And so we're gonna do that before we get directly to discourse on method. So if we look here, look at the dates of Aquinas' life from 1225 uh, to 1274, common era. Um, and what he really did, what his achievement was, was that he was able to take the, 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 the philosophy of Aristotle and much like Augustine who created this synthesis of Platonism and Christianity, Aquinas did the same essentially with the thinking of Aristotle. Um, one might wonder, well, why did it take so long uh, for the thinking of Aristotle to influence Christianity? Uh, essentially, the thinking of Aristotle was not uh, uh, was was not very well known in the West. It was, however, known quite well in the Islamic world. As you can see here, some of the prominent Islamic theologians who were influenced by uh, Aristotle, among others. Um, and what essentially happened was that Aquinas, who was the, one of the had one of the brightest minds of uh, Rome, was sent to Paris to stamp out what the Church perceived to be an Islamic heresy that was being taught uh, in, in, uh, on the left bank uh, in Paris. And, uh, and, and then he also went to Spain as well later. But, um, but what uh, Aquinas found was that what was being taught really was, was not so much Islam, but Aristotle. And, and he became fascinated with Aristotle and, um, uh, and, and, then, and then did for Christianity, much like what Ibn Sinner, Avicenna did for uh, Islam or Ibn Rushd, Avareros did for Islam. Who th these thinkers were thinkers who had created uh, much like uh, Aquinas for Christianity, but prior to Aquinas, this this uh, very satisfying synthesis of Aristotelian philosophy and Islamic theology. Um, and so uh, it was with, it was precisely in the Islamic world where the texts of Aristotle were, were preserved and were much better known. The Crusaders, when they went to um, you know, fight in the Crusades, they were often surprised to find that the Islamic, uh, Arab Islamic civilization, uh, Burbo Arab uh, Islamic civilization, North Africa, tend, seem, tended to be much more advanced and developed than, uh, than, than Europe. And they wondered, well, what is it that the, the, the Muslims have that that, that the Christians in the West, we the Christians in the West, as they would see it, don't have, and precisely what the Muslims had was uh, was Aristotle. Now, Al-Kindi is noted, I, I mentioned him earlier, he's the, uh, that should be 800 uh, to 873, he is the uh, theologian um, uh, who, uh, he's, he's known as the father of uh, philosophy in Islam, uh, because he translated much of uh, Aristotle and Plato into Arabic, and so the the Islamic world was was much more uh, uh, aware of these texts than the Christian West until Aristotle. Excuse me, until Thomas Aquinas. And I might note that uh, also Maimonides for uh, did for uh, Judaism what Aquinas uh, and, and did for Christianity in the sense that he also created a, a kind of a synthesis of Aristotelian philosophy and Judaic. Theology. This is something that Derrida criticizes Maimonides for. Interestingly enough. Okay, so uh, so let's let's just be clear then. So there are different terms for this uh, that you'll come across. Realism is one term. Thomism is another. Scholasticism also. Uh, Descartes will will refer to uh, the the schools. Uh, uh, being, you know, the scholastic, you know, teachers, and he was uh, himself, you know, steeped in the teachings of the schools and, and found himself as a young man to be very impatient with, with his teachers and very impatient with what was being taught, which he, which he just, it didn't uh, appeal to him much. Uh, but you can see there the dates, 1100 rough dates to 1700 common era. The, the, this would be the period in which uh, the, the, the so-called schools, the scholastics, the Thomists, were so uh, influential in 
uh, in Europe. Um, uh, but let's note there they remain in the Catholic tradition today. Thomas Aquinas, as well as Augustine, both remain very uh, in, influential figures. But in, in the time that Descartes went to school, they were hegemonic. Uh, the, the, the teachings of Thomas Aquinas were hegemonic. Everybody had uh, to learn them and, and he didn't he wasn't happy with what he was studying. So we'll see. Okay, now I want to note, as we get deeper into some of these distinctions between Platonic idealism and Aristotelian realism, which becomes, you know, Thomism and the Christian tradition, uh, uh, we want to be careful um, to be aware of what, you know, Heidegger uh, or what Derrida, I should say, will call the Plato effect. And that's sort of the difference between, you know, the history of the reception of Plato in the West and the, and the, and the kind of Plato that emerges, as we've already discussed, from carefully attending to the actual texts of Plato. And uh, Heidegger, for instance, in Introduction to Metaphysics is going to observe, it's going to say that Logos has the character of the Luan or of revealing not only in Heraclitus, but in, uh, in, uh, in Plato. Okay, so what, what the point that he's making here is we're going to see is that um, but let's, let's think for a minute, uh, for instance, of what we read in Phaedrus. So that in, in the Phaedrus, um, we saw that, you know, Socrates was describing that when the lover uh, beholds the beloved, uh, you know, the, the person with whom he's enraptured and, and has this experience, this sort of thunderbolt experience of, of love at first sight, he catches, uh, he's, he's um, you know, he, he seems to be catching a glimpse of a kind of a shine uh, a radiant shining forth, you know, that, that, that literally sort of emanates from within the body of, of the beloved. Now, he can't have a direct apprehension of, you know, of, of being as we've seen, you know, now we see, but through a glass darkly. Um, but, uh, but, 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 but the beauty is so uh, overwhelming. And, and, and he and remembered the truth, the true and the beautiful come to be essentially conflated that he it's as if he's um, uh, seeing a kind of a halo or a glow emanating from the body of the beautiful youth. Well, uh, we know if you, all you got to do is look a little bit at the history of Western art. Just you'll, you'll be aware of this kind of glow or halo effect, but it's, it's linked to this kind of idea of truth being more uh, akin to the, the, the disclosure uh, 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 of beauty as, as an event, as something that happens in, in the framework of time. And so this, this kind of conception of, of, uh, of truth as the beautiful is, um, uh, or what, you know, say Gadamer in uh, The Relevance of the Beautiful call the sens sensuously abundant object is, is present in Plato as well as in Aristotle, but because we get this, we have this long history of the reception of Plato and we get this sort of cliche, for instance, one that's recycled in the thinking of Chomsky, that, that Plato is, is an idealist and Chomsky's going to say, well, he was on the right track, Aristotle wasn't. So Plato is an idealist and Aristotle is a realist uh, who's more interested in uh, essences that are concealed within us, whereas Plato's got his eyes fixed on the heaven. I mean, there, there are some, there is some, you know, truth that Plato is more, uh, you know, focused on the transcendent than, than in, in a way that's not really the case with Aristotle, but, but, the, but there, but those differences can be exaggerated uh, as well. So Plato does indeed, as Heidegger's going to say, lay the foundations for a thinking of truth as correct perception. And, and yet there still is in Plato uh, a thinking of truth as something that discloses itself in a temporal sense uh, that's very similar to uh, what, uh, uh, you know, high, what, what, what we're going to call aletheia, which we'll, we'll uh, look at in a minute, or what in Aquinas it comes to be known as um, uh, the quiditas or the essence of the thing linked to the idea of, of the epiphany. Okay, so let's, let's continue. Um, so uh, here's this word aletheia. Um, which uh, any reader of Heidegger will be very familiar with this term. It's a very important term for understanding Heidegger. We're definitely going to come back to it and work on it a little bit more. But here we're just going to talk about it in passing to better understand the thinking of Descartes. And this is a word that means uh, literally from the Greek, uh, it means unconcealment. Um, Aletheia, you can see her on the right, is, was, was a goddess. 
uh, literally the goddess truth. And Heidegger likes to say she was not the goddess of truth. She was the goddess truth herself who discloses her, uh, her discloses herself uh, as, as uh, to Permenides um, in this wonderful uh, poem that, that Heidegger does this very careful close reading of that, Permenides, uh, that was written by Permenides in his book on Permenides. And I, I would suggest to you that, um, that this is a, a, before even going to being in time, after reading the introduction of metaphysics, that, if, that, that the sort of the second text I generally recommend students have a look at is Parmenides um, or possibly the principle of, uh, principle of reason as well. But Parmenides does, is, is, will, get, will give you a really nice overview of differences between you know, truth as you know, ratio, competence, correct perception, and this this more this this pre um, uh, modern this more pre platonic more originary idea of truth as unconcealment uh, or truth in a temporal sense um, in uh, in in the thinking of um, you know pre Socratic figures like Parmenides. All right, and there in the middle you see it written in in, in Greek. Now to read Heidegger, sometimes I just note again that Heidegger something passing you know that he will drop in Greek phrases. And, you know, if you don't have access to Greek, you can you can make a, a well enough sense of Heidegger. Um, but some of these words are, are useful to kind of familiarize yourself with in the original Greek, like logos and aletheia, because they are repeated so often in his work and sometimes not uh, translated. He, he, you know, he was, remember, he and Nietzsche both the, 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 the phenomenological hermeneutic tradition in, in uh, Germany uh, grew or, or was was related to the uh, full of the set philology um, and um, you know Nietzsche is often if you've ever been a reader of Nietzsche you'll know that he's often talking about philology and so uh, similarly Heidegger's interested in doing close readings of Greek texts and, and investigating uh, etymologies uh, as we're going to see etymologies of Greek concepts and words not to recover some sort of originary uh, um, you know, um, not 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 to to to, to cover or, or to consider or to to claim that uh, this is the, the necessarily the, the beginning, uh, or, or uh, well, Heidegger will say that the that the, the in Heraclitus and in Parmenides and other, and many of these early pre-Socratic thinkers we have what he's going to call the the inception, but but my point is as Nietzsche is going to say is that that you know it's not really he's not really performing an archaeology as much as he's performing a kind of a genealogy, uh, uh, which is, and there, there's an important difference between these two terms, uh, which we'll, we'll uh, explore. Okay, um, so uh, let's, let's uh, be clear then, when we think of the Christianization of the concept of Aletheia or, uh, you know, truth as, as a kind of a disclosure, or an, uh, an event in time, or the unconcealment of, of the being of beings, to put it in Heideggerian terms, um, we can think of you know uh, what we, we should focus for a minute on what uh, Aquinas is going to call quiditas. This is a common term, and so when you read, for instance, the thinkers of the British empiricist tradition, like Bacon, who who reject, who, who agree with Descartes in his rejection of uh, of, of the scholastics. Off, you'll often see reference to this term, you know, uh, uh, the quiddities, the quiditas, which means literally it means the whatness of the thing. So you could say, well, the thing discloses its whatness to us. That sounds kind of a funny way to think about it. But um, you can, if you look at the image of the Christ child there in the middle, who's, who's literally glowing as, as the magi uh, surround him. Now, the three magi are, are the wise men who travel, uh, bringing... Uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the Christ child. Now, these are not like Christmas gifts, like the kind you put under a tree, certainly, buy at Walmart. But rather, uh, these are the tools of their trade because as magi, they're, they're magicians, or they're sorcerers. And so the, the notion here being that when they when they behold the radiant child who's, uh, who, who discloses his divinity to them as, as the, uh, the, the, the incarnate deity, God in the flesh, um, they are sort of effectively uh, giving the, the tools of their trade to them, which is to say they are they're relinquishing them. They're 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 giving up their uh, practices, their 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 previous uh, religion, which would be like 
akin to the sorcery traditions in ancient Egypt, and because they have found something that is uh, that is uh, really true, and this is this this God child or this God man, and as he is in Christian theology in the West, who is um, uh, you know Jesus. All right. So again, we've talked previously about this. Um, you have there. You can see there. Uh, the three, uh, to put it in, in, in somewhat anachronistic terms, uh, we think of Thomist uh, epistemology as well as Aristotelian epistemology. We can say that, uh, again, all things that exist are good because God does not create anything that is not good. Uh, and so this is the first criteria uh, that, that by which we can know that a thing is a thing, and that is that it is suitable for receiving a form. Okay, now... Um, this is uh, important to note too. Um, again, if we think of Augustine, uh, uh, the question of sin, as, as we've uh, discussed, is um, uh, is something that does not in uh, uh, Christian theology have an ontological character, which is to say sin does not exist. So here's the paradox. It doesn't mean that there is not sin. It just means that sin is not a, a, a thing or it has no ontological objective character. And so um, uh, in that sense, it, one of the you know reasons why it's good to think about the question of nothingness is that it helps it can maybe help also uh, uh, us to reflect on the question, well, what is this notion of sin that's handed down uh, to us? Uh, we'll come back to this also when we look at you know Freud. Uh, but uh, it's not a uh, it's not a thing. Okay, that's what's important to to note. It has no thing because everything God doesn't create in in Christian theology things that are evil. Everything that is is good, uh, and so it meets everything that meets the criteria of of uh, having a form. It's it has integrity, uh, but nonetheless. Um, uh, not all things are as symmetrical as one another. And this is the, the criteria of, of proportion. Some things are better, are, are better made, uh, better sh uh, shaped than others. Uh, but the final, uh, you know, at the final stage of the recognition of the sort of the quiditas of the thing is its clarity, what we call its halo effect. This is kind of a radiant shine that glows forth. So literally this is why Christ child in the manger is, is literally glowing as we see in this image. This is a very common kind of image um, in, in Christian iconography. You'll see it in Christian kitsch too, the kind of stuff, you know, you buy at Kmart or something. Uh, the, the crash, the plastic crashes people put out in their lawns. Uh, but you can see here to the right that the halos, the halo glowing from, from the child and from the Madonna as well. Um, and then to the left, uh, that's an image of, again, the goddess truth. Alethea, who precedes uh, this, uh, you know, who's who precedes the, the Christian tradition, in uh, and, and who Parmenides writes about uh, in his famous poem. Now, uh, again, I note this term epiphany. Uh, if you're a student of literature and you've read Joyce, Joyce's, uh, you know, uh, portrait of the artist as a young man, or Dubliners, or Ulysses, you'll be familiar with this term because it's through Joyce that this term enters into literary studies, and, uh, and and Joyce was himself steeped in the teachings of Thomas Aquinas, and much like Descartes, he had a very similar education to Descartes, albeit, you know, many hundred years later, uh, because uh, he, was tr he was trained in a Catholic tradition, very similar to the tradition that Descartes studied in. All right, so now let's turn our attention to what Descartes has to say about the schools and what his a critique of them is. Uh, this is from Discourse on Method. He says, I have never noticed that by the method of disputation practiced in the schools, any truth has been discovered of which one was ignorant before. For one cannot so well grasp a thing and make it one's own when it is learnt from another person as when one discovers it oneself. Uh, there's again, you know, close this, I, this, this theme that's going to run through Descartes' book. Uh, Descartes' writing is close the books, go out, they look at the book of life. Don't just focus on what's written in text that we've we received from antiquity. Um, I am convinced, he says, that the most devoted of those who now follow Aristotle would think themselves happy if they had as much knowledge of nature as he had, uh, even if it were a condition. Uh, that they never have more. They are like the ivy which does not seek to climb higher 
than the trees that support it. Well, this is, you know, this is a pretty, if you think about this, this is a pretty audacious thing to say, given the, 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 uh, the, pre the preeminence of the, of the scholastics at the time that he's writing. So he's, he's really very much a very revolutionary way going against the grain. And, and while it's true that, uh, that the church is, is later going to you know, effectively deem him to be a heretic, and, and reject his his uh, uh, you know his claims that he's discovered uh, an absolute you know proof for the existence of God, um, and 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 find him to be uh, you know uh, a, a variance with the teachings of the church. Um, it's it's also true that uh, you know if you fast forward hundred years later uh, that that Descartes. Um, really did he he he, he his uh, cr criticism of the scholastic tradition of Thomism was very decisive and it had a, it had a long lasting uh, influence and it's it's really uh, arguably you could say well this is the beginning of of the Enlightenment so remember you know that that Descartes is uh, a late uh, medieval early you know rena he's he's a Renaissance type thinker uh, early Renaissance and so he's he, he he well he's in the Renaissance but he's he's uh, he really lays the foundation for total transformation um, that was that, he, that ultimately his his critique of the scholastics uh, in at least in the history of philosophy was to, was to prevail. Okay, um, so let's continue. Um, so here's now. Uh, I think this is, in my view, this is one of the most important passages in the discourse on method, and it comes in discourse six. Uh, and so I would urge you to carefully look at it because here we find Descartes not only um you know just simply uh, as a like a rebel who rejects the teachings of his uh you know uh, of his uh predecessors but he gives a, he gives a very clear reason why and so the, and, and this encapsulates much of his thinking and, and so even though we're going to see as well that the british empiricists are going to reject uh, you know, Cartesian metaphysics and, and many of the claims of Descartes, that this is one aspect that they're going to completely uh, agree uh, with and, and appreciate and, and see perhaps as his most important contribution to the history of philosophy. Okay, so let's, let's read what he says. He's, he's going to say in Discourse 6, it is better to use only what presents itself spontaneously to our senses, okay, and here we're talking about, we think in pl uh, platonic terms, uh, we said the basic concepts of metaphysics can often serve as a kind of a compass for us. We're thinking about here uh, uh, in terms of the, the empirical trace or what the British empiricist David Hartley is going to call the impression, uh, the, 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 we, or what we've discussed in terms of the spectral image, for instance, that enters your body on the lens of your eyes. And so he's saying, you know, even though we know that Descartes is the great doubter and he's going to doubt every sensual uh, stimulus that he comes into contact with, nonetheless, here he's affirming that these sensual stimuli, that the, that the empirical traces that we, um, you know, experience in an empirical external sense, May are a more legitimate starting point for philosophical inquiry um, than what he's going to call these more rare and abstruse phenomena. Okay, so let's let's read it. Uh, which we, here he's talking about the concealed essence or the quiditas of the things. This is a direct attack on Aristotelian epistemology. All right, so he says, it is better to use only what presents itself spontaneously to our senses, and of which we cannot remain ignorant, provided we give it even a moment's reflection than to seek out more rare and more abstruse phenomena. Okay, so if you study this and you understand what's being said here, you're, you're on your way to uh, really beginning to get at the heart of what Descartes is, is saying and what later uh, thinkers are going to appreciate in his thinking. So, all right, so Descartes, this is a famous painting called The Laughing Cavalier, and Descartes is, uh, uh, is uh, perhaps one of the most, ca he was a cavalier, but he's also very cavalier in his thinking. Uh, and so in any case, we're going to ask you, how is it that our cavalier achieves certainty? All right. So let's, let's look at how he, uh, arrives at this, uh, foundation that he, that's going to, from which he's going to tear down the entire universe and then rebuild it again. All right. And I'm going to call this, I'm calling this Descartes journey around his bedroom. It's a very uh, interesting novel by Gottfried Ben called journey around my bedroom. And this is what Descartes does is he takes a little journey around his bedroom. 
uh, he, he seals himself away and, and, go, and takes this kind of interior, internal, uh, goes on this interior and internal uh, adventure. Right. So he's going to say, as soon as I reached an age which allowed me to emerge from the tutelage of my, again, scholastic teachers, I abandoned the study of letters altogether. He gave up books altogether and resolving to study no other science than that which I could find myself or else in the greater book of the world. I spent the rest of my youth in traveling. All right. So here we find uh, Descartes. And this is a very prominent metaphor in the Enlightenment, this idea of the book of the world. Um, that, you know, the idea is close, close the books that, you know, that have been handed down to us from antiquity and go out and, and, and read the book of the world. This is going to be, for instance, a very deist idea that the world is, 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 is kind of like a book of signs that we can interpret. And, and uh, for instance, in Thomas Paine's Age of Reason or some of the founding documents in American, uh, of American government written by Jefferson, you'll find this, uh, this figure used quite a lot. Uh, and it's it was very prominent in in, in at the time uh, that um, uh, uh, in, in let's say the uh, 18th century, and so Descartes is is perhaps is, is the figure who gives us this metaphor that uh, that later figures are going to uh, uh, celebrate, like the deists. Um, so he's going to say he 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 spent his youth traveling about, you know, kicking about the world, uh, studying, you know, seeing what he could from from. Uh, interacting with others, testing myself, he says, in situations which chance afforded me. But after several years studying thus in the book of the world and seeking to gain experience, I resolved one day to study myself and to use all my powers of mind to choose the paths which I should follow. And that's kind of a reconstructive painting of what the young Descartes might have looked like. Uh, but uh, so here are the young man who's uh, audaciously rejected the teachings of, of the scholastics and then gone out and, you know, seen, saw a bit of the world at his tour. Now he's going to retreat to his room and see what he can find by looking inside himself. He's going to say, I was at that time in Germany. I spent the whole day shut up in a room heated by an enclosed stove where I had complete leisure to meditate on my own thoughts. As I wanted to concentrate solely on the search for truth, I sought to reject everything in which I could suppose the slightest reason for doubt in order to see if there did not remain uh, after that anything in my belief that was indubitable. All right, so um, here we go. So this is the beginning. This is, you know, the deductive method, right? So he's going to deduct or say, say uh, reject take away every sensual uh, uh, stimuli. Uh, he's going to th think of, you know, th if he experiences, like I'll give you, um, for instance, in uh, if you've uh, watched uh, The Christmas Carol or read Dickens' Christmas Carol, when, when Marley comes and sees Scrooge, he says, uh, Scrooge rebukes the ghost and says, uh, well, there's more gravy about you than grave all right so in other words you know maybe you're just i'm, I'm not i think i'm seeing a ghost but it might have been just something i had for dinner uh, well this this is what uh this is what um descartes is saying is i don't i'm not going to trust anything i'm going to treat the stuff everything that i experience in sensual fashion much like an image that i might uh you know see in a dream uh, or it might maybe it's a hallucina a hallucination so what then remains after one takes away uh, all of the, the semi, uh, sensual stimulus. And this is what he's going to you know, find. Um, all right. So, um, all right. So here's, here's an image of, uh, you've seen these uh, sensory deprivation chambers there on the right. You see someone floating in this water. I've actually done this. There's a place here in Bellingham where I live uh, where you can, you know, I don't know, for 50 bucks or so you go in and you, you float in this, uh, in this water, uh, they put salt in the water and they close the pod. And, um, you know, at first they play music and then the music fades away. And then you're just, it's like, you're just kind of floating there. And, and you, you begin to have some people even, you know, hallucinate, uh, have out of, out of body, uh, experiences. I was not, uh, effectively able to achieve that blissful state. Uh, you know, because of course, you know, you're floating in water and even though they put salt in it, you, you, you know, you, you, you still are feeling something as I think it's Aristotle who says that the sense of uh, touch is the master 
sense because we can lose all of the other senses or every other sense is, is, is just another form of, of touching. Uh, but if you lose the sense of touching, you're, you're effectively dead. So you can't, you know, there's this idea that you can totally deduce or deduct all uh, sensual stimuli is somewhat uh, illusory, but this is what, you know, Descartes is seeking to achieve. And, um, uh, you know, look, if you can see to the left, this is a late medieval, early Renaissance, you know, bed. And uh, Descartes would, would climb into his little bed chamber and uh, draw the curtains or shut the door. And he would be in a sort of his early version of the sensory deprivation chamber, uh, trying to find, you know, uh, what remained after he had taken away every sensual stimulus. Okay. Um, so, um, I want to note here, okay, I, I, uh, I'm saying here that Descartes is building, he built his house on a metaphysical rock. So that I want to be clear here that, see, one, one of the things that, that's, that's quite, you know, interesting about Descartes is that, um, you know, this is a point that, that Derrida makes, that Heidegger makes, is that often that, uh, you know, that, that even though this, the, the deductive method is, it seems to be a method of radical doubt, and it begins by doubting everything, but it but it ends up in a position of absolute certainty. This was somewhat, you know, paradoxical um, uh, that the thinker who's who doubts more than any other thinker ends up completely in a position of, uh, of, of certainty where he's beyond doubt. And we're going to see this includes not just the question of his, the existence of his soul, but the existence of God uh, as well. Uh, God is not something then, this is the problem, of course, that the church is going to have with Descartes is that God is not something that one, you know, believes in, but one can know for certain uh, exists. Um, this is, this is, uh, you know, you know, David Hume, the, the British empiricist tradition are going to say, well, you know, Descartes is wrong. You know, once you begin, the, once the worm of uh, doubting uh, begins you can you can sure doubt your soul and you can doubt god there's not there's nothing that cannot be doubted but descartes does reach a point where he ceases to doubt and he finds this uh, bedrock of certainty okay so let's read his language on discourse three he says at this time i rooted out from my mind all the errors that had hitherto introduced themselves not that in doing so i imitated the skeptics who doubt only for doubting's sake and affect to always be undecided for on the contrary my whole plan had for its aim assurance and the rejection of shifting ground and sand in order to find rock or clay all right so see descartes is is in search of this uh, this ground or this foundation to stand upon okay and we're going to see for instance, in uh, Heidegger's reading of Leibniz, his principle of reason that the re that reason itself is a, a ground. When 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 Leibniz is, when Leibniz uh, says uh, that uh, there's nothing without reason, this this word reason is interchangeable with the word ground. There's nothing without a ground, and this ground is a metaphysical ground. And this is what Descartes believes that he has found. Okay, he says, like a man who walks alone. And in the dark, I resolved to go slowly and to use caution in all things, that even if I went forward only very little, I would at least avoid falling. I believed I would, I would have sufficient precepts to guide my action in the four following rules, so long as I took a firm and constant resolve, uh, never once to fail to observe them. So he's going to make some rules for himself that he's going to follow. These are uh, what we'll call uh, Descartes' uh, four life rules. He only needs uh, four of them, not 12. You might note he's a little more humble. Uh, 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 and he's going to say, here, here, are the, here are the four rules that he's going to establish that, uh, that he's going to live by, almost in a, in a fanatic way. Many you know, philosophers are are eccentric and he's he's eccentric in the sense that he's he's fanatical about the rules that he uh, uh, makes for himself and he follows them very methodically he says the first rule was never to accept anything as true that i did not know to be evidently so that is to say carefully to avoid uh, precipitancy and prejudice and to include in my judgments nothing more than what presented itself so clearly and so distinctly in my mind that I have, might have no occasion to place it in doubt. Okay, and we're going to find what these 
what it is that he finds uh, that that is that presents itself so clearly and so distinctly that he can't doubt it. And we're going to see essentially three things that we're going to see: uh, self or soul, God, and uh, uh, geometry, ge geometrical forms, which he believes also, like uh, uh, Plato, he believes were uh, placed there by God, uh, it placed in the in the mind by God. Uh, the second to divide each of the difficulties that I examined into as many parts as might be possible and necessary in order to best solve it. Okay, break down my tasks. And third, to conduct my, my thoughts in an orderly way, beginning with the simplest objects and the easiest to know, in order to climb gradually, as by degrees, as far as the knowledge of the most complex. And the fourth, everywhere to make such complete enumerations and such general rules that I would be sure to have admitted nothing. All right, so there's his careful uh, method, and he follows it, and it's it's the cogito, as we're going to see the cogito ergo sum that he discovers by virtue of enacting this method. Okay, now we need to also be aware that Descartes is going to adopt what he, uh, what he's going to call a provisional moral code, which can see tells us this consists of three or four maxims which he's willing to uh, disclose. Now. Um, a, a maxim is a term that you, you you really need to be familiar with. You'll see it uh, a lot more. It's a little more common term in 18th century philosophy. Uh, Kant is going to speak of maxims, for instance, in his categorical uh, imperative, which we'll discuss. But what for our purposes, I want to just you know note that um, in passing here that the, the adoption of these maxims. Uh, already uh, compromises arguably uh, Descartes' procedure in, in pretty profound ways because, because a maxim, what's important to know about a maxim is that a maxim is articulated. Uh, we, when we read about, you know, Socrates, who, who his man who went to, uh, sailed up to the heavens uh, and caught a glimpse of, of justice, the ideal justice, uh, justice as the truly existing you know, intangible essence of justice in the realm of being. Uh, this would be a notion of justice that would not, uh, that would be that would be separate from the realm of becoming. And the the what's important to note about the maxim is that it's it's a principle, but it's not merely an ideal abstract principle. It's a principle that is articulated, and so it's therefore linked to the question of of the law, because a maxim is a kind of a law. Uh, becomes a kind of a law for uh, for Descartes, or you could say, we could say Descartes is making a kind of a a social a contract with himself that he's going to follow. But he to to be able to proceed, he's going to need to articulate these laws. They can't be just vague uh, notions floating around his brain. They have to be uh, actually articulated, right? So he's going to, here's what there is going to say to obey the laws and customs of my country. Now, Descartes is most definitely not uh, a Marxist thinker who's interested in questions of praxis, like the hallmark of the Marxist tradition is this idea that is it's actually inscribed on Marx's tombstone that, you know, uh, hitherto the philosophers of the world have reflected upon it, but the whole point is to change the world, not merely reflect uh, upon it. Um, this is the Marxist idea of praxis. Well, this is, well, Descartes is diametrically opposite of that. Um, he's not interested in, uh, in, in any sort of praxis in that sense. He's, he's going to very obediently follow the laws and customs of his country, including his uh, religion, uh, so, so was enabled to be able to conduct his uh, philosophical experiment. Um, okay, second, to be as firm and resolute in my actions as I could and to follow no less constantly the most doubtful opinions once I had determined upon them than I would if they were very self-assured. All right, okay, there's another maxim. Number three, to try to always conquer myself rather than fortune and to change my desires rather than the order of the world, right? There's the uh, non, he's, he's not a praxis oriented thinker again. And generally to accustom myself to believing that there is nothing entirely in our own power except our thoughts. So again, you can't, if you can't change the world, you can at least change the way you think about it. And that's all he's really interested in doing. Uh, number four, 
to devote all my life to the cultivation of my reason and to progress as much as possible in the knowledge of truth. All right, so he's going to become, a, 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 let's say, a fanatic obsessed uh, thinker who wants to do everything, devote his entire existence to cultivate his reason and to progress in the knowledge of truth. All right. Uh, so here again, is the, here's what a maxim is. It's a concise articulation. I note there in italics, that articulation has to be, it has to take a, a form that is articulated, whether we're talking about uh, something that is spoken or written, it has an empirical external character uh, of, of a general truth or principle or rule for behavior. All right, Kant's, uh, here's the, the key instance of this, it, Kant's categorical imperative is to act only according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it become a universal law. And so we're going to uh, return to this as well when we look, for instance, at Rousseau's social contract and at Kant's towards uh, perpetual peace. This comes from his uh, prolegoma on um, uh, his, uh, to the metaphysics, um, which was prior to his critique of pure reason. But this becomes a really important notion in, uh, in Western uh, philosophy and Western law as well as we're, as we're going to explore. Okay, so what is the deductive method? All right, well, I, wanna, uh, I want to uh, uh, really emphasize here, I put in big letters here, to know discourse for, all right? Because, because if you were to only read one you know, part of, of the discourse on method, discourse on four really in a very concise way encapsulates Descartes' thinking. And so these, the passages that you see in the first two or three pages of the fourth discourse, uh, you should attend to very, very carefully and know very well and study line by line, sentence by sentence. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm pulling up a few of these here. So we're going to look at them uh, very carefully. All right. So here's what Descartes says. Because our senses sometimes play us false, I resolved to pretend that nothing which had ever entered my mind was any more true than the illusions of my dreams. Okay, we've, we've already discussed this. I doubt everything, like, like Ebenezer when he sees Marley. But, but immediately afterward, I became aware that while I decided thus to think that everything was false, it followed necessarily that I who thought thus must be something. All right, now there's, there, we have, there we have a really key uh, passage there uh, where he's going to say, uh, he is, uh, I, that I who thought thus must be something. Well, there's the red cogitons. He is a thing that thinks. He is a thinking thing. And there's the Cartesian definition of, uh, of, of what it means to be a human, a thing that thinks. All right. Now, what we're going to see is one of the things that's problematic about uh, Descartes' uh, position is that he doesn't really he doesn't really ask the question of what it, what it means to be a thing or he, if you if one says that one is a thing that thinks then one is a thing in uh, in being or let's say a being in, in the realm of becoming uh, but but what is this thing that he is this is a question that he doesn't pose okay the way that Heidegger will say this is that he doesn't ask the question of what the is is he just assumes that the is is but he doesn't put the is into play and it's because it's for this reason that we can think of Descartes as, as, a, as a kind of a naively metaphysical thinker he's certainly not challenging the metaphysical uh, tradition of Aristotle He's, he's delimiting it in effect to the to his to his soul or to his his self as, as this thing that uh, that thinks okay um, let's okay um, so let's let's uh, let's let's continue um, okay so observing this that this truth I think therefore I am cogito ergo sum was so certain and so evident that all the most extravagant suppositions of the skeptics were not capable of shaking it, I judged that I could accept it without scruple as the first principle of the philosophy I was seeking. All right, so there you can see there's the uh, gold miner. He's found his nugget of gold, Eureka, he's found it. And so Descartes has, has found his truth, his cogito ergo sum. And so after tearing apart the entire world, doubting everything, that existed. Now he's finally found something that he can no longer 
uh, doubt, and this is the fact that he exists. And this is this is a matter of certainty for him, an absolute certainty. And this is our, this is effectively where philosophy stops, or at least where questions stop, and where the the, the thesis uh, begins. And so we said that this is you know deduction is you know reasoning from the general to the particular, it's because it begins. It's, it's it's a thetic form of thinking. It begins with an interior internal intuition that one. Uh, asserts uh, and and does so in, in a vigorous fashion, and so this is Descartes' thesis. In effect, it, it's not a question; it's it's a thesis, and from this ground, he's going to rebuild the entire universe and become, as he calls himself, the master and possessor of of the universe. Uh, our, this is some have linked the this text to the the, or the beginnings of of imperialism, in effect, or imperialist ideology. Okay, he's going to say, I could pretend that I had no body and that there was no world or place that I was in, but I could not for all that pretend that I did not exist and that, on the contrary, from the very fact that I thought of doubting the truth of other things, it followed very evidently and very certainly that I existed. I thereby concluded that I was a substance of which, in order to think, needs no place and depends on no material things. Now I, I've placed this expression needs no place in italics here because every, you know, the cl claims to being in a metaphysical sense, like he's making are, are, are always attended by uh, the, the, the problematic of non-being as well. And so here we have, again, we can think of, we think of Aristotle's principle of non-contradiction or law of non-contradiction what we call Hamlet's question, being, non-being, to be or not to be. Uh, the claim to being here, let's note, is attended by a reference to this no place, which he tells us that he quite frankly uh, needs. He needs no place. And core, as we know, in Platonic thought, metaphysical thought, is that placeless place. And so uh, depend one has to read this carefully because he's saying, uh, that it depends on that that this thing that he is depends on no material thing. Uh, one 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 could read that as what it, it depends on uh, on 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 the coral uh, abyss on on Cora itself, the placeless place of the being of beings uh, disclosure. Okay, all right. Uh, I, uh, I I've got a picture here. Uh, you might note there on the uh, on the right. That's our friend Walter White from Breaking Bad. This is one of the final scenes in the movie or in the show. If you've watched it, he's 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 been led, led a life of uh, crime, and now it's his, he's finally dying, and we see him laying on the ground as he's he's dying, and 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 this happens a lot of you know movies. You see the camera sort of pans back. And, and we're supposed as the as the camera pans back on him, we get this sort of feeling that he's his soul is leaving his body. Well, that's a very you know Cartesian idea. You can say uh, that, that you know the sort of this this mind body dualism really comes you know with Descartes. And you can see there on the left the uh, the Renaissance uh, dissectors who are who are doing, performing an autopsy on the body on the body. Uh, this was the era of the, of the beginnings of autopsies. And uh, we could think of the body in Cartesian uh, thought as literally kind of a, a dead object extended in space. It's it's a mere body. Uh, we're gonna as we're gonna discuss when we talk more about animals. It's, it's a mere machine of which the consciousness, logos, reason is inserted uh, within. And and so uh, you know uh, this this is a op this opens up a problem which is which is uh, you know with us today as well. Um, so I, I want us to think about this question. What does it mean to need no place and to depend on nothing? And there's a picture of a kind of an abyssal, uh, groundless ground where this is, the, you know, the core, the place that is no place. Uh, you know, to what extent is Cartesian thought indebted or, 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 or indebted to the problematic of, of the Platonic core as well as this metaphysical claim to uh, being? Okay, and so this I, the mind by which I am what I am, is entirely distinct from the body, and even that it is easier to know than the body, and moreover that even if this body were not, 
it would not cease to be all that it is. All right. So it's very similar to what we saw in the Phaedrus. The, the soul is, is the oyster. The body is the oyster shell. You can cast off. Uh, the, the body can will go into uh, a decline. It will, uh, the body will die. It will evaporate. It will disappear. We can burn it if we want. We can bury it. But it's dead, and um, uh, but but the soul, this this being that he is, what, that he is what he is, this being that he is, continues to exist because again, like the Platonic idea of the soul, it is eternal. It partakes of being of the timeless, truly existing, intangible essence. But note note the tautological nature of the articulation of the of this formulation. Where he says this this mind by which i am what i am there's there's the claim to pure being so this is what a tautology is uh, like our friend popeye there i am what i am right a statement that is asserted to be true merely by virtue of stating the same thing twice so what popeye says is not terribly different from what descartes is saying here but it's also we can think in on the, you can see on the left that you have this what's called the theophany of the name in the old testament or the uh, uh, Torah, when um, you know, when when Moses goes uh, on Sinai and he speaks to the burning bush and he learns the name of God uh, given to him as Yahweh, which which is which means you know I am, uh, and, and 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 so later, for instance, in the uh, German uh, Romantic tradition and and in some of the theologies that develop in the West, this this is this uh, is is a way of linking God, the the God of Abraham, the biblical traditions. Uh, the Abrahamic traditions to this uh, this this uh, entity that that is it's a it's a very metaphysical conception um, of God. Uh, the the Derrida is going to be very critical of of this. For instance, when Maimonides moves in this direction in his thinking in Judaic theology, uh, Derrida is very you know uncomfortable uh, with this way of thinking about God as being because it be precisely because it's a very Hellenic way of thinking about being and that that's arguably not really characteristic of uh, Judaic thought prior to its uh, the, the Hellenization of Palestine. All right. Um, let's continue. So having noticed that there is nothing at all in this, I think, therefore I am, which assures me that I am speaking the truth, except that I see very clearly that in order to think one must exist, I judge that I could take it to be a very general rule that the things we can see very clearly and very distinctly are all true. Okay, so we know, we'll need to uh, talk, you know, more about this. But uh, you know, uh, the things that this, this is that you can see there on uh, underneath this uh, quote uh, a diagram which shows us this this Cartesian way of as we we'll say we think of Cartesian epistemology of knowing so that the eyes with the eyes see clearly you can see there uh, um, the eyes looking out at the objective external world and on and on the human interior, interior you see there in the brain a kind of a an image of the pineal gland which is where Descartes believed that this uh, divine seed that God uh, you know planted uh, uh, in his body uh, resided uh, for him. And so that, that we could see like we're talking about, you know, ratio, a competence is this, again, the squaring of what's on the inside with what's on the outside. Uh, we'll, we'll continue thinking and working about this a little bit. But I want to note here this um, in, in Descartes. Let's, let's first, before we talk about geometry, talk a little bit about uh, Descartes' conception of God, which I call here proto deist. I mean, Descartes, it's, it would be somewhat anachronistic to call Descartes a deist, but he does lay the foundations for a deist thinking of, of God, um, which I think is also one of the problems, again, that the, that the church authorities have with his uh, theology. Um, but he's going to claim, you know, uh, that if he exists and he can be certain of that, he can also be certain of the existence of God. Uh, because he's going to ask himself, well, I didn't make myself, so somebody higher than me must have made me. Uh, let's, let's, uh, or some being, you know, the, uh, must have put this consciousness, this rational thinking in my mind. Um, all right, so he's going to say, because it is no less contradictory that the more perfect should proceed from and depend on the less perfect than it is that something should emerge out of nothing, it is 
or thinking or reason uh, must have been put in me by a being whose nature was truly more perfect than mine and which I could have any idea. That is to say, in a single word, which was God. All right. And so just in the same way that he doesn't doubt the existence of his own self, he also does not doubt the existence of God. Now, we're not going to get into this, but I'll just note again here in passing that um, he also, there's this whole sort of discourse on, you know, he asks himself, well, could some malevolent demon have placed this, uh, you know, this, this, this consciousness in my head in order to fool me? Um, and uh, this is also was very uh, controversial uh, for church authorities because it seemed to be attributing, um, you know, evil characteristics to God. Um, I, I won't go into that today, but you can you can look that up if you want to uh, pursue that. But but effectively, for our purposes, he he doesn't doubt himself. He exists, and now he doesn't doubt that God exists. And again, these are not faith based claims. He's not. He doesn't say I believe in God. He says it's it's undoubtable that God exists. This is something of which we can be certain, much like the geometrical forms that I uh, can see clearly in the external world. Um, so as you say, hence there must of necessity be another being, perfect being upon whom I depended and from whom I acquired all that I had. All right. Now look, look below there. You can see in the middle an image of a pineal gland, an actual, you know, pineal gland, which, which is a place where Descartes, you know, believed uh, what was a kind of a divine seed um, what, that, that God had placed you know, in the brain. And so part of his interest in dissection was, was to, was out of link to this quest to discover in the pineal gland, this, uh, th this, this transubstantiated, uh, aided seed or the, as, as in transubstantiation, the doctrine of the church where, um, you know, where the, uh, where matter, where base matter, the, the what is the sensual uh, trace in the realm of becoming becomes transmuted into something, you know, metaphysical, like, for instance, in the Catholic tradition, when the priest consecrates the elements in the mass, the, the, the bread and the, and the wine become literally the blood and the uh, body of Christ. And so, you know, similarly, this, this was the, was going, was construed or believed to be the meeting place of the eternal and the, uh, uh, the, the, the sensual realm. Um, and so uh, you can see there again on the, uh, on the left, an image of the pineal gland inside the head, um, which was for, for Descartes, he believed to be the seat of consciousness. And like, you know, like Chomsky in search of his universal grammar, uh, Descartes, you know, was interested in, in delving into the brain to find this magical seed, which he never uh, found, of course. Um, all right, so Cartesian ratio, this is from Discourse 5, this is a key concept. We've talked about ratio with respect to Plato. When we're talking about, uh, again, different terms for this, uh, competence, adequation, veritas, uh, you know, correct perception, the opposite of which, for instance, of competence is incompetence, uh, the accuracy would be the ina inaccuracy, and so on. But he's interested in accuracy, and this is why one of the reasons why he's so interested in geometry, as was Plato, for instance, in Plato's Dialogue Mino. Well, that's one of the places you would go to find this kind of uh, pursue this line of thinking in Plato, the Dialogue Mino. Um, I have observed certain laws which God has so established in nature, and of which He has impressed such notions in our soul souls that, having reflected on them sufficiently. We cannot be in any doubt that they are strictly observed in everything which exists or happens in the world. Um, and then, okay, so when his discussion of, you know, this, these geometrical forms that he's also certain of, so I set out uh, after discovering the truth about God's existence to seek other truths and turn to the object of the geometers. Uh, it is at least as certain that God, who is this perfect being, is or exists as any geometric demonstration can be. Our ideas and notions being real things and coming from God insofar as they are clear and distinct cannot be other than true. All right, so this is why Descartes is so interested in, in uh, geometrical form and forms um, and uh, let's note that we think if we can think of like, you know, uh, like if I were to create, a, a, like, let's say to draw an image of a geometrical form, like a triangle in front of me, 
that that form, no matter how perfectly I you know, drew it, would still be an imperfect representation of this more perfect form, which is um, which is this uh, uh, you know partakes of of, of the eternal. Uh, but 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 the point of it being that one represents the other. One is a repre representation uh, of the other, and this is what uh, competence uh, means in effect. And so, an inaccurate uh, representation of that form or an incompetent one would be, you know, would be a false uh, representation. So in this sense, the opposite of, of the, uh, uh, of, of the, of, of what is accurate, it would be inaccurate or what is true would be considered to be false. This is the idea of, of, of truth that comes to us from Descartes, but is already preceded in Descartes thinking by in the thinking of Plato. But remember in that, in that earlier Greek tradition, which we're going to also discuss when we get to Heidegger, um, that uh, aletheia, which is truth as disclosure, uh, it, it comes from the word lethe, which is the river of forgetting, ah, lethe, which is, um, uh, which is the, um, you know, would be the negation of uh, forgetting, which would be essentially remembering. But, but in effect, the, uh, uh, the opposite of aletheia, truth as disclosure, would not be the false, it would be forgetting. It would be that this event of truth's disclosure would be forgotten. And that's the older idea of truth. That existed, you know, prior to this idea of truth as competence, which is really the more modern idea of truth. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, excuse me. All right. So here you can see some uh, some representations of uh, this this competence or seeing with the mind's eye. So we have the eye that sees uh, these forms. But inside of the eye that sees, there's another eye. This is kind of like what, what Nietzsche will call like a, a cyclops eye, like a cyclops lodged in the middle of the head. A one, you know, this one-eyed cyclops, which, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when, when uh, Odysseus uh, blinds the cyclops, he gouges out the eye, which is uh, uh, for uh, Derrida is going to note like uh, akin to, uh, you know, blinding. I mean, the, the, the one-eyed, a one-eyed uh you know, monster is a very phallic kind of image. And, and the thinking of this eye with this, this interior cyclops eye within the head is also against a very phallic, uh, you know, logo, phallo logocentric uh, notion. Um, but so there's, there's seeing with the mind's eye, the eye lodged inside of the head, like a giant cyclops eye. And then there's the, um, you know, the eye that one sees with that, that, that which transmutes the image into the uh, you know chamber of, of the head or the brain. Okay, so let's let's uh, we, this is again this image that we looked at previously, which I, I said I would come back to on a t on occasion because again it gives us a sense of what we're talking about here. We looking in uh, into this world. Uh, if we are the sovereign who sees from this cyclops eye within this lodge within our head, but looking out at the image through our eyes, we see a image of the sovereign, you know, king and queen on the far mirror uh, behind us. That would be the representation or the representation uh, uh, of, of our body. But we see from this sort of visible, invisible uh, ground or this, this like, like I should say, not visible, invisible, but, but present, absent, uh, metaphysical ground, which, which does not itself, uh, you know, it, it can only be represented. It does not itself uh, appear in the realm of becoming. Okay. So this is, these are uh, notions of Cartesian certainty, correct perception, which is called ratio veritas in the Latin. Um, and Heidegger is going to observe that it's precisely the translation of, uh, of Greek philosophy into Latin, where, in which many of the concepts of truth that we receive uh, from antiquity come to be uh, transformed. This is for problems of, of translation when one goes from the Greek to the Latin. So, the, but so the Roman or Latin term would be veritas, adequation, or serum, rectitude, competence, or what Chomsky is going to call this oxymoronic expression, unconscious knowledge. Um, these are all ways of talking about what is essentially the same thing. Um, Heidegger is going to say, let's note, the taking as true of ratio becomes a far-reaching and anticipatory security. Ratio is a self-adjustment to what is correct. 
Ratio is a power of the human mind, the actus or mental act of which inhabits the inner man. The res, which is the thing, uh, lies apart from ratio. Uh, in rectitudo, as adequatio, ratio is supposed to be to assimilate the thing. Uh, and if we consider that for a long time the essence of man has been experienced as the rational animal, said Aristotelian idea, uh, the thinking animal, then it follows that ratio is not just one power among others but is the basic power of man, all right? This is why it's worth reflecting upon. Uh, in order to obtain the true as what is right and correct, man must be assured and be certain of the correct use of his basic power. The essence of truth is determined on the basis of this assurance and certitude. The question of truth in the modern age, especially after Descartes, becomes the question of the secure, the assured and self-assuring use of ratio, okay? This is, again, truth that can be calculated. Uh, but what happens when we come across uh, uh, something that defies our ability to calculate, the incalculable, uh, what is, uh, you know, unexpected? Um, for instance, I'm, I'm giving these lectures in the context of this coronavirus pandemic, which is sweeping the world, um, two weeks ago, I was going to be going on an airplane to Morocco. All that had to be canceled. Um, you know, uh, our, my whole life has been turned upside down, like, like so many of, of you, uh, who have lived through this, uh, pandemic. And so we, this was, none of us saw this coming. No, uh, stock market has crashed. The world has, uh, changed dramatically because of this, uh, uh uh, unexpected uh, phenomenon. Uh, Derrida will talk about this in terms of, you know, messianicity or, or the event, like what happens when, when that which is beyond our ability to calculate uh, comes uh, upon us. Uh, well, uh, uh, Descartes is interested in truth that is, uh, you know, that we can, we can calculate. All right, here's Heidegger on Descartes and scholasticism. Everyone who is acquainted with the Middle Ages sees that Descartes is dependent upon medieval scholasticism. But with this discovery, nothing is achieved philosophically as long as it remains obscure to what a profound extent the medieval ontology has influenced the way in which posterity has determined or failed to determine the res cogitans or uh, the thinking thing. All right. So again, to, to, to briefly paraphrase, um, Descartes, you know, uh, when one reads Descartes and one historicizes him following, let's say, Jameson's mandate, always historicize, one sees that he is, in fact, dependent upon medieval scholasticism, the very metaphysics that he uh, that he rejects. But this uh, this uh, indebtedness that he has to the scholastics is is forgotten. And this is going to be linked to this very prominent Heideggerian theme called the forgetting of being, the, our, the, the losing of interest, the forgetting of the question of metaphysical grounds, which is what is characteristic of, of the modern period. But when we read Descartes in his own context, we see that he is indeed a profoundly metaphysical thinker who is uh, dependent upon the very uh, you know, Aristotelian Thomas th uh, theology that he's rejecting. Um, here's Derrida's uh, way of putting it, uh, and I'm, I'm putting a few words in his mouth here at the beginning in brackets, as you can see, that post-Cartesian claims to certainty are problematic because they reveal, and here are Derrida's words, because they reveal indifference not only for the question of being, but also for the entity which we are. Now, no, you know, Derrida will not use this term, das sign that we find in Heidegger, which we said means, you know, being there. Uh, he, he speaks of the entity uh, which we are. Um, but, um, you know, it's a point well made. If we're not interested in asking the question that Heidegger is interested in asking, it shows a, a, a profound indifference to who we even are. How do we, how did we become constituted in the way that we're constituted as, as human beings? So the history, you know, this, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this, this itinerary that we're following here of looking at this history of concepts that are uh, that have accrued throughout 
the you know 2,500 years of, of philosophy. Um, it's it's very uh, important. This is what sort of part of what deconstruction you know does is it, it explores. Um, you know, not to, as Spivak's going to say, not to find some sort of ir originary truth, but as much as to, to uh, you know, examine what she'll call the itinerary of, of the silencing. And, and even though uh, Spivak is, is not a particularly Heideggerian thinker and is critical of Heidegger, um, and more, she's more influenced by Derrida and Marx, uh, nonetheless, uh, this, this, is tr this, is, this is true in her thought as well as Heidegger's thought. All right, so as we're getting ready, as we're concluding here, um, in the next lecture, we're going to explore um, uh, how Car Descartes' thinking about language and the animal has remained enduringly influential in the present, particularly as it's taught, um, as, as Chomsky and neo-Cartesian linguistics are taught in the American university today in the context of the United States, which I'm teaching. Um, and as we're going to see, the thinking of Descartes, um, you know, uh, lays the foundation for the advent of uh, factory farming. Uh, this is going to be a problem we'll also uh, explore in the next lecture and that later down the road when we look at Derrida's um, The Animal That Therefore I Am, obviously a, a direct uh, 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 reference, uh, allusion to Descartes, cogito ergo sum, uh, Derrida is going to look carefully at how Descartes does indeed lay the foundations for uh, thinking about the animal, which, which the ancient world would have regarded as uh, monstrous, uh, which Aristotle would have regarded as monstrous, as we'll uh, explore. Um, so I leave you with a question here. Uh, my, one of my favorite African writers from Nigeria, Chinua Achebe, uh, is going to describe Rene Descartes as the father of a gigantic philosophical accident. Um, is Descartes a figure that we should uh, venerate as the father of modern science, or, or did he father a giant uh, philosophical accident? It's interesting that Achebe uh, says that. I, I, I'm, I do uh, work in African studies and African literature, and, and, and it's certainly the case that Descartes is, is not uh, appreciated in Africa. West Africa to the extent that he is in, uh, in, in European society. And so for further reading, I have, uh, I mentioned here, David Columbia's The Language of Science and the Science of Language, which you can find in Diacritics, where he reviews some of the questions, particularly that we're going to be looking at in the next uh, lecture. Then my own text, Chomsky and Deconstruction. Uh, there's a, a, a nice, concise uh, overview of it in, that would appeared in um, uh, Derrida Today by Mara Steele that you can also find easily on the web and you might have a look at that as well. So that will conclude this lecture and the next lecture is going to be, as I said, on uh, the uh, Descartes, uh, what I'm calling Cartesian linguistics and the animal. Uh, and so that would be the one where you'd go after this to follow through.